David Aldrich is here, our speaker tonight. He's a 10 year resident of uh, Merida. I met David a few weeks ago when he attended one of these talks back in December, I think. And I'm literally chasing down the street once I found out who he was. Someone said, That was David Aldrich. And I wanted him very much to do a presentation here. And I was able to track him down. Last week, he uh, presented or he opened his house to us on the House and Garden Tour. And I was kind of happy about that. I thought, Oh, this is great. A chance for our library members to finally see David Aldrich's house. No one's ever been in it before. Well, it turns out he's been hosting wine tastings there. He's hosted artist studio tours there. So people said to me, I've been in the house, this house five times. <laughs> so thank you for being such a good supporter of the library. Uh, David is a lifetime fine artist, a medical illustrator, uh, has a background in human figure, and that's what he's focusing on now again, as you can see. Uh, this is a mask alphabet, please. So keep your mask on for the whole time you're here, and there'll be time for questions at the end. David, if you will go ahead. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm coming through the. Uh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for attending. Uh, uh, remember, this wasn't my idea of a hot night out. <laughs> <laughs> Times change and we move on. And here we are. Um, so, when I was asked to speak, uh, I was quite flattered. Uh, Scott had said he had sort of heard me as a medical illustrator and different things. And what should I talk about? And so, what? Just whatever you want. So, that left me thinking, uh -huh, I didn't want. I didn't want. So, when I thought in the end, that I would talk about some aspects of being a real estate, uh, being a realist artist who deals with the uh, with the, the, the figure. I took the road to Real Agatos because uh, it's about my journey, really, to Real Agatos. Uh, Real Agatos is a small town, a small pueblo up on the Gulf Coast, uh, second home of uh, breeding ground, actually, for the flamingos. And I've been up there and I've you know to do the regular tour stuff. And there's something quite special about this town. It wasn't as this is really God, it was, as you can see, small town stuck out this little peninsula, uh, really separated by this large expanse of jungle from uh, the TC Dennis is the nearest city. And the thing that got me about it was that it was it was impeccably clean. Which seems highly unusual for for Mexico, it, but it wasn't anything special as far as as any uh, you know geographic things. And the more I, I looked at it, the more I thought it was interesting. Like what you know, it was the community of Rio Grande that seemed to be really interesting. And I connected with Joe Hope, who owns um, one of the hotels there in Yuma. Through this idea, Pastor, uh, what if I could do a portrait of real Agapos, one of the people who make up that community? And she got excited about it. We ended up having a, uh, uh, she arranged a meeting with me and um, a number of the townspeople who were, who were there, people who had a certain influence. As I found out, everybody's related in real Agapos. It's quite fascinating little town. They were excited. And I was there this, when I gave this presentation. My friend Holly came along with me, and they immediately said, Well, let's go now. And off we went. And they took us through the town looking for people who they thought would be truly emblematic. And what I wanted to do was to, to, to do a portrait and show the diversity of this community. So, uh, two, the, the first, in the end, this is going to be. Uh, uh, 12 paintings. It's, it's, I don't, I take a long time to paint, so this is probably a two year project. Yeah. Uh, the one over there with a the couple, that's the first one that I finished. Just this, this, this couple for me is kind of a Mexican Gothic picture. They're an aspect of that traditional 
uh, Catholic um, you know, Maya way. And this is the second. This is this is the second one I'm doing. This is not finished. I normally, in fact, this is the first time I've ever publicly shown anything that isn't finished. Uh, but but I thought I'd bring it just to give you this idea that I have this project going. This was the bar, La Siete de Copas. The uh, bar owner at end is in the center, and it's kind of the center, two bars, and this is the bar for the ne'er do wells of Rio de Janeiro. So it, it, it will end up being a, a full series. But I thought what I would talk about is not this series per se, but say this point is where I'm I'm seeing, and, and in a way, it'll be kind of a summation for me at 72 years old. You know, my runway is getting near the end. So I think this will be bringing together things that I've experienced. And that's what I want to talk about is this journey, this road for me personally to, to avail of job. So really, I mean, when I was, when I was in high school, I didn't you know I did stand things. I was always doing arts. Got to, like, what I wanted to do was go to uh, art school. But of course, you know, being a uh, you know a good little middle class kid, that especially back in 1967, that was simply not something that was allowed. So I went to the University of British Columbia and took a degree in art history. What else that would you do? And I did an Oriental art history. So uh, when I was first started, and, and I'm going to talk about some of the influences that happened there, and what I what I'm going to try and do. And, and have you come along with me on this is to understand certain aspects of, of realism. Um, one of the things I'll preface that that, that I, I will put this, this talk around is the one thing that people say to me right up to this day, perhaps more than ever, is they see my painting and it, it's just like a photograph. And that's both a comp set is a compliment, and by others as a complete dismissal. It's just like a photograph. I thought it was interesting. So I want to talk about just like a photograph and what the thoughts are and what my dealing with the surface with that retinal image. That just like a photograph is very minimal in, in what I try to do. So I started in, in uh, UBC, Oriental Arts History. I remember after the after I left it, I thought, my God, you know, this, this was primarily Indian art prior to 1345, back in the days when nobody worried about getting a job. You knew you'd get once you do whatever you wanted. And I thought, if anything else, I'll probably be interested in cocktail parties. <laughs> but from this end, I look back, I think it was the singularly most influential thing I ever did. Now I started in in uh, uh, you know, art uh, fine art one hundred, and we got to this thing of Oriental art history that I've never heard of, and it was just well, we're not going to cover this one third of the book, uh, but if you want to take it, take fine art uh, two twenty next year to cover it. So of course, immediately because they weren't going to cover it, I had to do it, so I took it, and and it was fascinating. And I think that as I say, in the end, where I am now, it changes. In the way I was thinking, it opened my eyes to a half the world that it didn't know existed. It was this entire world of a philosophical way of viewing life and viewing our senses at a complete opposite end. I think of, of what we what we see in uh, in the West philosophically. I think in the West we believe what we perceive is ultimate reality. What we visually, and I'll talk about vision as the perception that visually we perceive ultimate reality. And even if it is an atheist and nothing happens after death, or if you're you know, full-fledged, born-again Christian, that ultimate reality continues after death. You know, when man is made in the image of God, man is in the likeness of God. When you, when you leave this life, you see people, the self, maintains itself because it is the perception of ultimate reality. And from a Western perspective, 
it is that what we perceive is an illusion, that we can't perceive ultimate reality, that life is the dream, it's this brief moment, and all we can all we can look at and understand is we're trapped in the illusion of life, and ultimate reality lies beyond that. And it is impossible for us to know it because we are in prison within the illusions and the perceptual illusions of life. So I thought it, was, it, 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 it affects me the way that there are these, these two different ways of viewing that retinal image of factual, perceive it, it goes forever, and the other one, which is it's all an illusion, is just a play, it's just for now. So I continued my studies of working on my BA, and of course in that era, as in 1968, 69, you know, if you were all intellectually anywhere, you did drugs. And I did drugs. <laughs> and I remember my third acid trip, which became my last one. And I bring this up because it, again, significantly changed me. I remember I was, you know, doing everything, and I would always get to this point where I would lose touch with reality and kind of freak out. It wasn't something I'd like. And this time, I was in the apartment, and I completely lost touch with reality. And I remember I was lying on a bed just trying to make sense of something, and everything I looked at, everything, was flat, made no sense. It was just, the sound was, it made no sense. The visual was, I don't know, it's massive shape of color, maybe not even shape, it was just marks. It was insane. And everything was flat. And suddenly, as I started to come down, I remember, and I was lying on the bed, at the foot of the bed was a map of the world. And I remember, suddenly, I grasped there's a map of the world on the wall. Out of this massive mess of, of chaos, I found, a, I found a map of the world. And suddenly, beyond the map of the world, suddenly I could see people, and they were like paper cutouts that were moving all on the same plane as the map. And then sound began to suddenly get a bit of three dimension. And suddenly the paper dolls came away from the wall and started to suddenly, and that started to fill out and get round. And the sound did. And I remember suddenly getting back into the three-dimensionality of life, the, 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 the three-dimensionality of perception, of visual perception. And following at that moment, you know, life is this brief bulge into this illusion of life, this three-dimensionality. And I'm not going to leave it. I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to take this for all I can. And that was sort of the last day of, 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 of my drugs, drug usage. And it stayed with me as being fascinated with this visual perception, this retinal, this just like a photograph moment. And that's, been, that's played a large part in, in, uh, in, my, in my thinking. And the other thing, and I think that it's, I, I'm picking and choosing a few things here, and I wish you'd just work with me and keep them through the talk. And what I'm hoping is, is that in some ways, maybe you'll leave here maybe with a slightly different view of this, this, this wonderful aspect of, of, of visual perception. Uh, Marcel Duchamp, and I'm sure uh, if any of you are in the arts, you're familiar with this. 1917, a seminal piece. And I think seminal in many ways. As right after, during the end of the First World War, the Dallas movement, there was a lot of things. He took a urinal and he took it off the wall and he put it on a plinth. He signed it Armat and put it up for the exhibition. Well, I mean, it was scandalized and everything, but I think what he, what he did was that he embodied where art in the 20th and 21st centuries went. 
And it was this, this, this separation of the, the precise moment of the, uh, the, 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 the idea of, in this case, very much the idea of action, of usage, and changing it so that you see it and you perceive it in a different way. So it stops being a functional journal and it demands you think of it in another way. And I mean, this is this has been this was uh, really the separation of art up to that point into low art and high art. We, we, I think before that there was not quite the same descriptor as there is now. And now I think we we come along. One is commercial art. One is the art that's involved with the action of doing. And then there is high art, fine art. Which is about ideas, you know, and that the uh, and the sense that um, you know the the true meaning lies beyond the mere descriptor of the action of the moment. So hopefully that's I haven't lost too many of you on that thought. But but I think you think the urinal on the wall and you remove it, so now it's not a urinal; it's a shape. It forces you. To visually approach in a different way. I, I think now I think I think Duchamp, it, 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 it wasn't that this singular man suddenly created a, a whole new way of thinking. I think everybody, all of these things that really change, we find people who are emblematic at the time. They do something that embody where art was going. And it comes here, yeah, similar to Darwin. There were, you know, it wasn't Darwin that personally thought. About evolution, there were a number of people writing and thinking about it. He just happened to hit it. And I, so, so I, I think again, it's not obvious what this one person did. This is really emblematic of that movement at that time. Okay, so I took those away from uh, UBC. I went off to India, studied, came back. Now, didn't know where I was going to do. What was I going to do with this this degree in Oriental Art History? I enrolled in art education. What else do you do with a BA except to become a teacher? And I got accepted from the University of Toronto. At the same time, I was going to a, um, uh, a school uh, associated with the school, like three small schools, and doing some light drawings. I figured you know, I've done all of this art history, but what else had to do? I actually technically couldn't do anything. And I remember getting two months into it and thinking, realizing within six months, I was going to go out and be a specialist in art education. And I realized how absolutely ludicrous that was. I mean, I had as much business as a fly. Because I, mean, I couldn't, I couldn't draw. I, 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 was, I, I could talk about the Islamic invasions of 1345. But I couldn't talk about student art, so I quit. And I enrolled full time at the New School of Art. This was a, an alternative school run by uh, a number of very prominent artists in Toronto at the time, and uh, and started that. I think um, interesting thing back then, especially in this period, we're now in the uh, in, in the seventies or the seventies. Uh, or later, as you can see, 7778. Um, it was it was the era of Clement Greenberg. Uh, it was the tyranny of abstract expressions. Realism was just absolute heresy. It was of the past. It was it was the mural on the wall. <laughs> And art was now on the plane, the urinal on the plane. So I got it because, as I said, I worked with this uh, person, Diane Buchan, who would really have helped me with life drawing. And, um, and we had, uh, I got in there, and I was, I was the fish out of water. And of course, the more they tried to tell me that you know, I was a heretic, the more I kept thinking, well, well, maybe, but you know, listen, but what does this mean to be a person? And I continued on with drawing. I thought it was 
interesting in that was the, um, yeah, I actually had a, an instructor come up to me look for it and say, and he said, hey, did you do this? And say, I have no idea what you're doing, and I can't, I can't help you, and walked away. <laughs> and I think that was very much that theory. While I was there, I found that if I did the life drawing, and it was just from the model, we trying to learn to draw, and there would be male models, female models, female model, no problem, any, anything, anyway, fine. The male model, it just happened to be that the way they were lying, you could see the penis. The negative reaction was phenomenal. If I remember when you screaming, I, I, it, it, it was uh, uh, phenomenal. And I joined Dennis Burton because he was one of the main people at the uh, New School of Art. And he did these vagina paintings, and he would have shows in major galleries, and people would come and have cocktails and talk about it. But they couldn't, you couldn't do a penis, even when that wasn't about it. I mean, this is sexual. And I was just, it's just, that's life wrong. It's just what it was. So I began to find her. Try from there because I left after about a year and a half with the new school. I left and started a body of work where I wanted to find a way of making the male new, not naked, but new, to take it away from the sexual and uh, uh, take it away from uh, uh, being sexual and see if I can't rob it of the sexuality. The sexuality will have to be there. I, I, I understood that. But I wanted to take it away. I did not want the pornographic. So I started my journey as an artist, taking the urinal off the wall. And of course, that meant being the light as a waiter, because you would never make no money. So for a number of years, I did it. And I, I met with a fair amount of success as far as exhibitions go. Um, and the sales not that way as well. So I took this, everything here is from life. At this point, I didn't understand what you could use for the graphic reference at all. So everything was from life. And I was fortunate, people seemed to like what I did. I had uh, a lot of uh, people who would volunteer to, um, to, to model for me, so perfect. And I went through a series, and the whole point of this was I wanted to take the realism, I wanted to take that radical, retinal image and abstract it, abstract it without turning my back on the realism. So it was a case of thinking of, of shapes, of thinking of what I brought in, of how would I use the shadows, they were composition. Uh, you know, I, I played, I wanted to play with the, uh, with the, the frame. I wanted to bring not only the space this way, but that the three dimensionality of that retinal image, which is also front and back as well. So I just went through and continued on. So I'll really show a number of things. Again, bringing in anything as I would try to approach it abstractly, as opposed to just drawing lines, I would think, okay, I need something linear. I found something linear. Uh, and at this point, uh, a partner of mine at the time had these, these, these five pieces of black vitriol, which, which I, 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 I loved. The other thing was I found that I loved the vitriol. I was like to move these around and place them and draw it. It was still a matter of, of trying to take that figure and, and still from life. But not all, and it was still like a combination of the things that I would bring together. I love to play against uh, the, the hardness of the vitrolite, the softness of the flesh, um, the, 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 the essence of going back and forth. Again, I think there's a, a, a sensuality, but I want to see if I couldn't get rid of the sexuality. This again, um, looking at the figure. I wanted the sense of something hard, something soft, as seen as this radiator in this guy's house. So I worked in a series of things together. I wanted to get that 
the, the softness, the fluidity of the flesh. I want to get the feeling, the feeling of that immediate perception and counteract. And again, without, without a narrative, I, I was really trying to avoid the, the narrative. Uh, another one. Um, this one never sold, and it was always one of my favorites. And I, I don't know, I think it, it was again uh, that distortion of the body, that, that really getting, you know, zeroing in so close with the, with the foreshortening. But as I moved away, I started to think, okay, I was, I was working, these pieces were all about, oh, well, that thing. But um, it's 16 inches square, probably 15 inches square. But I still wasn't managing to get where I wanted as far as transcending the sexuality of the male form. So I started to do large paintings. This one was about uh, three by five feet. And um, it would, I took some of my the original drawings that I had, this is one, and tried to sort of bring it up just to see if I could make size be something different. If I could make it larger than a pornographic page, would, would, would I be able to actually release that, that, release it from the sexuality? Again, these are four feet square, put them together, try the dip ditch, working again. This was, uh, I would recognize it from the uh, first slides I put in there, taking this drawing with it then blowing it up and using that and uh, trying the multiplicity, trying repetition, trying ways of working realistically in a very abstract way. And uh, this one, actually this one uh, was from life. It was, uh, I actually had people pose for it. So I tried, okay, I try actually working from life, see what can happen. Again, this is a four foot square painting. Thinking of shapes, colors, ways of dividing space, but staying, staying truthful to the the uh, to the retinal image, and started to move move through this another uh, figure. My apologies on the color, the translation from the, the computer through this is not correct color. And then I started to get into doing portraiture. This was one of the first portraits I did, and it was a friend of mine. She was a uh, an artist, and uh, again another person who uh, Bill, who had worked with me a lot as a model. And uh, these are almost like songs. I was at the same time trying, okay, you know, move away from the the, the figure, see what I could do with with other things. So. As I moved on, I uh, you know, got tired of waiting tables and tired of being poor. So um, I, I, I ended up getting opportunities to illustration. And uh, again, the urinals back on the wall. It's uh, doing stuff, commercial art, stuff that's going to be involved in, in money and doing. It's like you've gotten ahead of myself here. Um, so I, I had gotten uh, in this period um, a commission it was from a, a, a bar to do a, a poster. Um, worked well, except I didn't understand um, using photography. It ended up being, uh, you know, they paid me five hundred dollars for this portrait, this which this poster, which back then was, you know, not bad money. But the amount of time it took because I had to do it all for mine. Then I got Ernie Chelko. He hired me off for a short time as the album in the studio, and I was introduced to photography, photography as uh, as photo reference. And so it was like, oh, that's how you make money. So I went on. I also had gotten uh, involved with some like the um, 
out there. Persons really like my work, they built their entire campaign for about three years around my style of art, and everything came in. So there were fitness books, uh, anything that had to do with ads, every ad they did uh, was was one book. I was allowed. And it was, I was allowed a, 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 a huge amount of creative freedom which I really thought it was just bought in and say, here's what we need. Here's the, here's the space you've got to work with. This is where the type goes. And, and, and I moved on with that. And this is um, my draftsmanship got me, got me into these, 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 these jobs. It also introduced to things like the graphics camera, the old camera that the uh, photographers used in the 40s with a sliding in front and a Polaroid back. So it was kind of this wonderful way to actually take photographs, to see your reference right there, no, I need something, no, I need to move it, change it. And it wasn't really a case about no longer trying to deal with any sort of particular aesthetic thoughts, but it really was about having that speak directly to the people who were watching, who were, who were consuming that. Um, at this point, I got into medical illustration, and it was, I had, uh, I had turned 30, and I remember sitting and thinking, you know, I lived in this garret, it was terribly romantic in my 20s, and probably would be okay in my 30s, but it was here, when I turned 40, I'd be pathetic. So if somebody had told me about medical illustration, I never knew there was such a thing. But I knew that they did a full dissection of a cadaver in the first year. So I went for it, totally intending to drop it out the first year, but when I could have a chance to dissect a cadaver. Uh, got quite taken with it and stayed with that. So again, another shift. Again, the urinal is still on the wall. We're still dealing with the, with, with the moment. We're dealing with action. We're dealing with those images. What I loved about medical illustration was that you had to draw realistically things that you could have no reference to whatsoever. The only thing you could know was you had anatomical atlases, you had live medical libraries. You know, you were trained to know what information, you know, to, to understand what the problem was, to be able to go and, and access the information and read it, and then the drawing abilities to be able to actually create it. So, you know, series of different things. This is uh, dealing with uh, thyroid. This is about uh, uh, small strokes in the brain. The other thing I found, which I loved about it, was that it was really about communication, and it was about needing to understand your audience, needing to understand what, you know, the visual ground and where someone can, comes in. So actually, the easiest thing was to illustrate for doctors. The hardest thing was to illustrate for the general public that really do very little. So in this case, this was, these were, were ads. Um, uh, this was for a particular a first drug that was used for this particular bacterial infection. It actually showed the first little signs of some hope, but that, that in this case still palliative, but still some hope. So this whole idea was the first light. So I wanted to get the sense of um, underwater mines. I could use those metaphors. This one had to do with the article on breast cancer. But again, on this side, something for physicians, it was easy. You know, everybody knows, they know the colors, what the colors mean, everything is in it. A lot of work was for patient education. More challenging because somebody comes without any knowledge of the body, they need to know right away at this moment, they want to understand. And how do you how do you actually manage to do that? I used to tell my students that I when I taught them in medical illustration, the medical illustration is about the fine art of dementia. You have to leave out 99.9% .9 of what's there. 
and you have to know what is that 0.1% that you need to improve and how to show it to that particular volumes. And again, these would become posters. What I'm showing here is, is work that is uh, before it was actually taken into print. Um, this one of them was interesting, got to a point, uh, you know, kind of to try to work it up, make it accessible uh, to the average person. Everything went through fine, the work was done, everybody did it. When it went back to the pharmaceutical company, it went through the layers, and somebody near the top had to be consulted and sent it back to me for corrections. And the only comment they sent was, because these were posters to go to doctor's offices, said that it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> so they said, no, no, the doctor won't put it up because it's not pretty. So I went in and I really pumped up the, the, the you know, in this case, the Crohn's, so I pumped up the blood and I, you know, really made the messy stuff messy. Send it back, she won't. So, uh, this is really showing you where that kind of stuff went. So, in this case, this was for a, a surgical drug, drug use in surgery, pepper cell. Uh, it had to be an illustration that would be, I was not told what it had to be, but it had to be told what it had to be. Where type had to go, it also had to work in three vertical planes as well, so it could be folded and worked out. Um, so work through that, get the sense it was going to surgeons, that's why we make sure the surgeon for the late understand. And move. This is patient education, similar to what I showed you before. They would be in these kinds of, in this case, it was done in a large booklet, it was designed to be a doctor's office. And that's how it was used. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit. I have this question posed to you. Fascinating at the time, which was hasn't everything in medical already been illustrated? And well, it seems to be true, it's not true at all. And 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 I'm going to take a break in, the, in my talk right now. Um, I, I did a personal detour around this point. I got positions in universities and got into uh, administrative positions and uh, we really did nothing for 10, 12 years, no joining whatsoever. Remember, one I read was uh, not a position at the Alberta College of Art Design in Calgary, and I found this house that had a studio, it was wonderful. And when I was explaining to it, uh, one of the faculty members was saying, Oh, that's great. And the president was saying, Yeah, I said, it's great. It'll be a good place to write memos. Which was really true. It was a sort of all consuming jobs. So, while well, I took that detour, I'm going to take a detour from this talk and just talk about some other things that some ideas that picking up from what we'll talk about that, that, that coalesced for me uh, over this period as well. So, I want to talk about when you say that everything hasn't Hasn't everything been illustrated? It hasn't, it hasn't, because it has the, the, the urinal on the wall is about the moment that you're in. And I want you to get, hopefully, I'm going to bring you through some examples so maybe you understand, I can you know, make this understand a little more. Um, so, when I'm talking about the immediacy of the moment, I, I'm talking, I'd like to think of, of, the, of, of a, a little Eastern, but if you think about this, I'll talk about one myself, I think you probably said something. I have never not been in the present. In the immediacy of right now, never. If I look at pictures of myself in the past, and I, you know, I like, I like, you know, I go back in the eighties. It's like I'm dressed for a, a retro party. You know, you know, oh my God! Rawr, 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 rawr. But I can honestly say, at any point, I have never been in a retro party. I have looked at the mirror 
and I look good. I've not looked good, but I've looked like I like I look now. I've never looked dated. I've never looked futuristic. I look just like I look right now. I can't get in the world, but as far as anything else, those things go. And I think I think that's interesting because in this moment that you're in all the time is the moment of action. The moment of, of uh, engagement, engagement with the world is the only time that in which you can act. You can't act in the past, you can't act in the future. You can only act now, and life is all about acting. We never leave that moment of acting. So, and and thinking back on 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 our not to shot, shop, right? That's we are only there while the urinal is on the wall. It's about, it's about the engagement of life at that moment. It's that retinal image. Now, I'll try to show you some things here. So this is uh, from uh, a new project that's been done, They Shall Never Grow Old. It's, it's somebody, I uh, forget the name of the guy who's taking this. He took First World War footage and altered it digitally, colorized it, made it, slowed it down where, you know, old films, everything sort of fast and jerky, and made it as close to what you would perceive right now. And I find this fascinating. I found when I did this, these guys, the first war, war feed has always been separated. It's never been a part of the immediacy of my presence. These guys are more, not quite. There's still some things here that are not done. But the, the change here is because this is more, has been brought closer to your retinal image of right now, of this moment. Another thing I looked through, I remember thinking, you know, to think back on this, one thing I kept wondering was, uh, I remember when Elizabeth Taylor came out to play Cleopatra. And of course, I loved it. Sam Kimmel and I'm getting and of course, she loved Cleopatra and Elizabeth Taylor. And I knew that this was just the way Egypt was. And I kept thinking when you look back you know, in, 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 in previous movies, that, that you know, in Claudette Colbert playing Cleopatra, it was the same, oops, sorry, the same kind of furniture. But why did they have, it, it certainly didn't look like Egypt. It looked like a 1940s idea of Egypt, right? But Elizabeth Taylor looked like Egypt. Well, now I look at it and they were like, well, I don't know they right? But I think what is interesting on that is, is that even to go back in time for a period, for us to be able to experience it, we need it within that moment of the present that we are. For us to go back and be a part of it, we can accept the costumes, we can accept the, accept the horses, we can accept Ben Hur, but he's got to look like you look at this moment. Uh, Pride and Prejudice, you know, Greer Garson, I don't know. I'll look at her, dear, it's like, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sure it was a great old movie, but I'm sure it doesn't look old British. Getting to the 1995, right? You know, suddenly it's like, oh, okay, I was transported back to that. And then if you look from then until the 2005 version, even more, you know, the idea, maybe it's, it's, there's, a, there's a casualness, but if you look at the difference between the two, there's still this somehow, at this moment, it becomes more accessible, whether it's better movie or not, something different. But I think that, that that interesting thing is that as soon as we something passes us, the moment we experience the moment of action, and the whole thing hermeneutics, is that it becomes layered with all other meanings. So when somebody said, you know, and asked me that question, why you know hasn't everything in medical illustration been done? 
I keep thinking, well, yeah, but like, what more can we say about Coca-Cola? But again, what Coca-Cola has to do with all of these is about reaching you in your moment of action, of reaching, reaching you in the moment of now, when you make those decisions. It doesn't want to be clouded by the past. It wants you to be able to engage. And to engage, it's got to be in sync with that retinal image that you have at this moment. So if we look through these, you can go right off the bat the different eras of these two. And this is a contemporary coca. <laughs> yeah. And this thing, there's, we only see coke. Oh, it, it's, it speaks to us directly. And I think I think that's again that that. Yeah, that urinal on the wall. So I'm just going to talk about these two things. I'm just using my own illustrations here, but good again, because this is is uh, one of my pieces. At this point, right now, I am leading uh, administration. I can see there's an end. I'm trying to say, okay, well, what do I do? You know, I want to get back to painting. I want to get back to art. But I don't know where to go. It's what do I do? You know, the sense that I somehow should be moving forward. I used to tell my students that, uh, that every piece you do should be the best you've ever done. And if a gear is in the garbage, you haven't moved forward. You should look back five years to think, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And, and I'm going to find out that works through life. So, what I you know, yeah, so I went back to the original thing. I went back to how, you know, how do I make the, 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 the naked man do? How do, I, how do I make people receive the male form the way you see David, Michelangelo's David? And I worked again with, with try to uh, work with some of those same things. I mean, technically, I don't know if intellectually I, I did anything different, but I think technically it got better. As opposed to the uh, supposed to be illustration. And I, I think what it is here, I think to remember, and I'd like to sort of bring here is this whole idea of this dichotomy that we created. You know, it looks just like a photograph. It's all about. It's all about this part. It's about the. the it's about being in the present, being in action of engagement. And what fine art becomes, and, and this has been taken over by commercial art, advertising agencies. You know, the whole idea is you're going to act. You're going to do something with this uh, at some point. Is to be involved in what you do in your day to day. In the fine art, because it's not about action, it's not about engagement, it's about ideas, it's about. So we block out the world of action. Now I'll take, uh, we go to the symphony. The whole idea is you enter a theater, you sit, you stay motionless, the lights go down so that you're only focused on this select aspect and you do not engage in the world if somebody has a cell phone that goes off or they decide to play arranged and then that, that, that horrendous woman who unwraps that and we hate it because it is bringing us back to a world of engagement as opposed to saying no no this is higher you can't have that so it's this again this this absolute separation. So I'm going to um, just talk about a couple of artists that, 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 that I find fascinating. I know I'm sort of coming out in a number of different ways, but hopefully just get you enough to think a little differently. And in this case, there are two artists that both deal with a human figure, and I always find, find both of them kind of interesting in the way they have blurred those edges. What is Gunter von Hayes? Body walls. Uh, 
It has to say here, sculpture in search of acceptance for rural art. He was a map, he is an analogous. You know, there's a lot of controversy about him. But he's 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 predominantly sculptural. His issue was how does he overcome people's inability to truly accept the the, the plastinization of human bodies. These are all bodies, there's lots of stuff, but they you know, include prisoners from China, there's a, a set of stuff. So what he did was, uh, he, he put these into exhibits as uh, science and sent them to science centers. And we all went to look because this was now educational. This was now involved with the action of the present moment. You could go and learn and take that away and do something. Um, this is a, a, from Albinus, and it's, a, it's an illustration. Now, this is from the 16th century, when it truly was a case of dealing with the body that had to be shown. This was a body which is in, in you know, the image of God, in the likeness of God. So it was a case of still not showing sure before the death. This was didactic, especially for them. And you can see the muscles have some uh, numbers in our hands. Van Hagen did this. But I think, and I'll show you, I think it was sculptural. For instance, this one, have many of you seen him's body worlds exhibits to been all around? This is absolutely, I mean, they're, they're magnificent dissections, but they have nothing to do with didactic learning. It's strictly sculptural. Again, another one of his pieces. So you see, he had these major pieces, and they're all sort of cluttered, you know, little things talking to you, but they're truly didactic. But this is what it's all about. You know, I don't think you can walk away from learning anything from this other than, wow, wow, interesting. Right down to this piece, which you know he's done, he's, put it, he's even put himself in the middle in this promotional shot of these people playing cards. You know, just so much taken from, from this. Strictly sculptural. This is not about this is not about having anything to do with a didactic aspect. Another person I think comes interesting, transcending, transcending the low art of medical illustration. Uh, Newman, he's a Canadian artist, looks out of Quebec. Um, now, I'll show you what he's just to show you what he's done. This is a work by the way, Foster Chuck. She was a Toronto medical illustrator in the 50s, worked extensively on a, a particular atlas, very nice set of collapse. She did beautiful We studied her all the time, we were just a master of it. And in medical pen and ink, there's this eyelash because medical. Illustration at this time. It was pen and ink because it was the, the best way of getting good prints. So, this whole idea of eyelashing was to create shape and express it. So, what Newman did was take this. He would take vintage pictures. This is a hermaphrodite. But he would use eyelashing. In ways to create form within the thing. So it's fascinating. And if you go through this, you'll see there's a hand there, there's penises, there's a, there's a the, the hands actually in, in the midst of masturbation. I mean, it's quite fascinating. I mean, all through this, he's taking the, the, the low art and taking it something quite interesting. In this case, this exploded head. He's gone in and he's used all of the different shapes that you would have used in medical illustration, but to create form, to create interest. Okay, and that was just to get you to a point of seeing, I think, you know, this, this, as they go on, I'm looking more and more at, you know, maybe the journal can be both places at the same time. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe Western art's obsession with the separation of experience. Maybe Western art's obsession with, but it's just a photograph. But 
it looks just like a balloon. You get to paint with a photograph. You know, and boom, you don't go any further, you don't go any deeper. So I started, what did I do? As I said previously, I went back, tried to find working from life. A friend of mine who proposed for me, worked up uh, composition. This is all pencil on, uh, on plate, plate, uh, paper. And then getting into looking at the figure. So this was starting back here uh, in, in, in Merida. I started to begin to find my way. You can see sort of the same kind of similarities. I'm still trying to deal with, with the male figure, trying to deal with aspects of it, but at the same time, trying to abstract, work with the abstraction of the highly realistic. Um, so then I tried this one. You know, again, less and less of the figure, more and more of the couch. Uh, you know, where the figure and the pillows become maybe an equal balance. Does this, does this help, help me get closer to it? This one again, just shapes it overall. It was irrelevant to me that you noticed it was more thinking as abstractly as I could. Uh, in this case, uh, fascination again with the radiators looking at, uh, it was so bad, my apologies. It's not like that, honest. Uh, but it was it was working with, with similar things, still trying to sort of find a path, but I hadn't found where I wanted to go. I wasn't, I still felt like I was locked back. Um, I try to, I, I do a lot of life drawing. I mean, I find it to, to keep me loose. I find it's important even when you're tight and wheels to do it. But I'm still trying to find, at this point, I haven't fully left ACAD. ACAD is not a traditional school. It's very much of a, you know, a, a, it's, it's actually very divided. It's got a very much strong, very traditional uh, design area and a strong, very, uh, very uh, plinth, fine arts. So I think I may, I may need to be stopped. So I, I would try it. I got into, uh, into more um, portraiture, uh, see if I could loosen it up. You know, could I find a path for myself there? Although most of you here, I'm sure, are familiar with Louie. Uh, God bless her, she posed for me several times. Again, all from life. And then I started to, to work. This was, I was in the, uh, in Canada. It's a niece of mine, and I have to catch a picture of her on the cell phone at a particular moment. And I thought that there was something there. And for me, it was, she was 13. Her, her mother didn't like it. She wasn't happy. But for me, then, what, I want, what, what I saw there was that 13, you know? Don't know what's happening, you know where you're going. It's that it's a, that strange time in life. And it, I just felt it from her. So I did this and, and I really liked, I really liked the light where it took me. I was thinking, you know, I, I was it was it was taking me, I think, to 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 a point of bringing those sides together for me. Um this is two parts. So initially, uh, it was a fellow who came over. He had uh, his partner. He wanted a portrait done. He did that to one of the um, open houses, the uh, studio tours. And he liked it, so he brought his partner over. He, uh, and uh, a bunch of photographs. I took this, did the portrait. Now in Toronto, he loves it. And I found it so interesting in the guy. There was another aspect I did. And so I did it not as a portrait, but it was more, this was me trying to be more the fine arts. It was the idea of the figure. Yet if I look at them both, and I see them side by side, they feel closer than I've ever gotten with those two parts. In 2017, I uh, was at this opportunity to go to a, uh, a workshop by 
uh, Shane Evans. Uh, she's American, uh, lives in uh, Elkhart, and happened to be, I was put in touch with her because the next buy uh, related to her. Went, got this thing, and it was one week of, uh, it was going right back to tight, 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 tight. And her partner, David Cassette, Casper, uh, was the same, just beautiful tight. And, and the interesting thing was that I actually had seen him in New York the summer previously. Oh, I love this car. So I went back there and it 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 flipped me to where I am now. And finally I decided it didn't matter what it was. I didn't have uh, enough of a runway to worry about gallery representation and developing uh, you know, developing a career now as an artist. So I could just do what I wanted. And and I started down the road where I am now. I'm going to show you one last artist. I don't like going. I mean, I acknowledge most the place in art history. I've never seen a glade I liked until I was walking through the National Gallery in Washington. And I saw this portrait, and it just stopped. I've never seen anything else where it's done like this. It for me, it was electric. I, I can't tell you. I just stopped. Uh, and nobody has ever jumped out at the like this. It was, um, I, I know, it was fascinating. What I loved about this was I knew it. I could touch it. He was there. He was a part of the immediacy of where I was. Um, I can, I can only make this sort of in, in a similar kind of way is if you take a, a, a literary uh, reference of George Eliot, who I find is a hundred like, but my God, the character uh, development that she has is amazing. What I loved about it was that I knew everybody. I knew exactly I met them. And I had the same feeling here. I knew this person. And this has become for me so where I said, where I want to go now. I want, I want to find the universal without having to deny the, the, the visual fidelity, without having to worry about where the Europe is. So I started off, and this is uh, another niece of mine who had come to visit. She was down at my house. Um, 16 years old. I wanted to, I wanted to, to follow along that particular uh, portrait of Bartholomew, say, Sereva. This was my aunt. Now, when I'm taking these now, I, um, I take reference photos, but I'll take 700 to 1,000 sometimes frames, because it's through all of these, the combination of all of these. I'll find, first of all, the ones that I want, and maybe it boils down to 10, and those 10 will give me different aspects of different things on that on that visual plane, uh, on that, that retinal image that, that, that I want to create. Um, you know, I, I can bring in the light. And I think that that's what really happened in illustration, especially in medical illustration. You had to know like the shadow because you had to create realism with absolutely no reference. This was a commission piece uh, of a lady who was a resident here for a while. Uh, her two granddaughters, very, very different personalities, that seemed to be different. And um, I feel like captured aspects of. The two girls, how they related to each other, how they related to the world. Uh, a couple of grandchildren again. Uh, another snowbird resident, like myself, here in, uh, in, in America. Um, was trying again particular personalities, aspects.
two minutes from just that, then I go from Detroit. Um, I wanted to get I wanted to get the better ones to also try and capture what that, that, that aspect is that was between the, 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 the particular relationship they had. I wanted the figures to interact with each other. Now, does this get here going out? No, probably not. But it's the ideal of what I of what at least I'm I'm, I'm aiming for. Um, my brother's dog, and this was in a very special way. So, a portrait totally fine. And for me. Again, it wasn't pictures. This is actually a combination of a number of different pictures that I have in there. But I wanted to get it done to the point where I could smell it. It wasn't done until I could actually smell it. And it does it for me. You know, I can I can smell it totally. And when it got to that point, I thought, okay, it's it's there. And then he was a he was a water dog. He had a sailboat. He loved it. So I put that sailboat in. The idea of he's still protected where he is. Sister in law, sister put her bed so she can look at it. So I think uh, it worked. Um, my partner did. Um, I wanted to capture him in ways that I know. Um, it was interesting. I've done a lot of portraits of them, but this one, it had been, I was up at uh, Calvin on Hollywood Ridge, which is above. And um, but my brother's Calvin, and you see this light that came through, and I tried for years to replicate it until I finally realized it only happened in a three week window <laughs> at the height of June. I've not traced the sun was never there. So I went up there and found the light, did I think about 1200 photos, came down and and, and pulled it free. Um, but I think it's I wanted to cut for his sense of bravado, which was not always true who he is. Um, practical guy. Um, And contemplative in ways that most people I think, don't don't know him as. And again, I, I, I love light. I love that that aspect of, of, of it. light period to me is, is huge. Um, this is one of my latest ones you can see here. This is uh, Patty Rogers, who's with us tonight. Um, and this one, this one it was a uh, a birthday gift. Um, from her husband. And you can see the difference of what this projector is doing. The color is astronomical. Um, it's, it's, uh, she has a particular painting by Cresham that, that she loves, the mermaid. So um, that's where I, I, I managed to get pressure to allow me to paint his painting in as well. And, and, and I, what I love was to just to try and you know, duplicate that, that sense of the mermaid at the same time. I wanted, I wanted the visual to be going this way as well as this way. I wanted that eyes of the fish and what was happening in their tracks and the mermaid coming up. She was on uh, was given to her for a Christmas gift. She had absolutely no idea it's coming. It is stunning. <laughs> and what I moved on to, and right now, I'm showing this is an unfinished painting. And as I said earlier, I, this is the first time I've ever shown my work unfinished. And the one over there is here. This is the real way out, of course. So, and I'm seeing this really as that culmination of where I've gone on this road to real way out. Of finding resolution between the urinal on the wall and the urinal on the plinth. Uh, between what do I have to do to have a show and what, what, do, I, what do I want to do? This it's, it's going in the direction that I want. Um, and I think, I think now what it is is that, you know, Bartholomew Soreda. You know, I, I, I want to I find. 
of our total survey that got for, for myself. So in this case, these two people, as mentioned earlier, they were um, you know, fishermen, both he and his wife, uh, Dan Borcoma. He's had a stroke, you know, you can tell it's a, a patient with paralysis. I could see all of these things as I was painting it. Fascinating when we went, and I think when I was looking at this, the other thing I, I, I learned in this process was as we would see these people, and we'd make an appointment to see the great one back in this afternoon at five. And we'd arrive and they would have changed. They would have gotten dressed up or something. And I would think, no, no, and then we had to wait, 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 wait. You know, this is me. I'm layering my alternative reality, right? I'm not, if this isn't the moment that they're in, I have to take them as they are. This is who they are. It's not a travel post. It's not a, you know, not, you know, it's not a National Geographic article. This is trying to capture who the people really are. So she put on her Sunday best dress, and so on dress, her, her best jewelry. He stayed just like he was in Coca-Cola chair. The, the shelf is crooked. It's been crooked every time I've gone They even mm -hmm. put a new church dress on it. I'm still crooked. So I kept it crooked, but this is who they are. You know, she gets dressed up, he does stays there. Um, and then in this bar, right now, so I've got about 10 paintings all in various stages. They're also composition of them together. And so the end was just coming into the bar and taking it as, as it happened. Um, I thought also maybe you could see, so I go painting, you know, I do numbers of passes. This is probably about five repaintings more before I finally get it to it. This is the ground here, hasn't been painted. Uh, back has had one pass, the figures have had two passes. These are probably the number three or four passes. But it's, it's that's so that's the journey that I'm at is, is um, yeah, it's been mine. So uh, that's, I've reached the end. <laughs> Did I answer anybody's questions? Yeah, I thought it was uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you for sharing that whole life journey. Yeah. Thank you. you know, I've had the opportunity to spend time drawing with you and just as enthusiastic as a day you are tonight. For those of you who can't hear, he's just saying nice things about it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> 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 